Today, in this live video, I wanted to talk about a topic that I think is kind of interesting, and it's not necessarily to do with pest control or disease control or anything like that. It's sort of to do with how agriculture and horticulture and really even gardening, all plant cultivation at the smallest scale or at the largest scale, uh, works with ecology. Essentially, what about agriculture fits in with ecology? And what do I mean by that? What, what is ecology and what is agriculture and how do they mix? So ecology is the study, essentially, I'm going to paraphrase, it's the study of how organisms sort of interact with themselves and interact with the environment. So you have biotic interaction, all of the biotic interaction. So that's parasites, that's hyperparasites on parasites, that's parasites on organisms, that's organisms feeding on plants, herbivores, right? Organisms feeding on other organisms, that's, um, that's uh, mushrooms and fungi and oomycota uh, feeding on plants, feeding on decaying organic matter, that's bacteria. But so there's also abiotic, so not to get ahead of myself, but there's also abiotic sorts of interactions, which can still be a biotic organism interacting with like, um, to give you a really exotic answer, sort of like stone and like having a chemical reaction and then feeding on the byproduct of that chemical reaction um, and that sort of a thing. So there's, there's all kinds of interactions with organisms and then also their environment, right? And so people talk in agriculture a lot about um, what is natural and what is not natural. But I, I find that the word natural is very much... Oh, I appreciate that, Rock Dust Advocate. Uh, get the notepad and popcorn. Well, I appreciate that quite a bit. I'm also, um, you know, I'm also dressed up for the occasion, right? So you know it's got to be something good. Um, but, yeah, ecology, agriculture, and, na and nature. Nature is sort of a loaded word, in my opinion. I feel I find that nature what is natural, uh, tends to change depending on who you're talking to. And sure, there might be, like, with organic, for example, the same sort of problem, but you've got, like, an officiating organization that tells you, hey, organic means these things for now. And if you want to add or subtract from that, there's a legal process and everything like that, right? So, yes, but natural also kind of has that with food a little bit. But I'm not worried about that. My whole point of bringing up the word natural is to sort of like not want to bring it up again. And if you want to talk about uh, things in nature, it's hard to use the word natural because it's become so loaded. I'm sure that makes sense. So without talking about that too much, I just want to talk about how agriculture fits in, and how all plant cultivation fits into nature. And um, the answer is that it's not. If you take the definition of natural, which is what I'm going to define right now, as, and not everyone defines it this way, and just for this particular conversation, I'm going to say that something that is natural is untouched by humans. And what I mean by that is regarding, in regards to cultivation. So, like, um, I had a, I've had a lot of very interesting and spirited conversations with people online on Instagram, for example, but also um, in various forums and just also in, like, not only internet forums, but actual forums um, on my YouTube channel. I've talked about these things and I've had them recorded, uh, which is really cool. I like doing that and I like having those presentations accessible for other people. But my point is that um, I've had conversations where in which people like to say that um, certain kinds of cultivation practices are more or less natural, but they're not necessarily with regards to human intervention. Because really, when you break it down to its fundamental level, all cultivation is sort of unnatural, right? Because you are, let's say you're in a forest. You don't have to do agriculture in a forest, and that's sort of an archetypical example, but let's, you know, let's go with that. You have a forest. Well, Let's say you don't clear the forest, and you try to plant your plants around the forest as much as possible. Well, you might find out that it's very, very difficult manually 
it's very taxing labor to plant your plants around the trees. The trees shade the plants, so the kinds of plants that you choose to grow, which, by the way, may also not do very well in that sort of circumstance, or they might not even be very very much well uh, cultivated themselves. They might um, they might be very much like what what their wild relatives are. If we're going really far. Uh, in the past, but if we even bring it back to modernity, and we have um, cultivation, we have plants that are like elite cultivars or post Green Revolution, and you wanted to grow them in like a forest, anyways, right? You still run into this problem of like how manually taxing it is. You run into this problem of how am I going to grow these plants without enough sunlight? I'm going to have to manually pick everything. I'm going to have to dodge through the trees. I'm going to have to deal with pests that are going to drop from the trees that are going to come out from below. You're going to have to deal with all of these factors, right? Because these organisms, they're not like bad guys. They're just eating food. They find a plant, and that plant happens to be something they can eat, and they eat it, just like we would, right? So right then and there... The big reason why people do a lot of the things that they do in agriculture is because they're trying to mitigate loss. They're trying to mitigate problems. And it makes total sense to do this. As a thinking, sapient being, you don't want to not do that, right? That makes sense, I hope, right? So it's because it's hard work to grow plants without making any changes at all. Now let's say you make a few changes. Let's say you make a change like okay, I'm going to clear this area of forest. Well, those trees aren't going to be very happy about that, are they? Well, they're trees. They're not going to think about it. But you're going to be cutting these stumps down, and then you're going to be getting rid of the stumps. So you're going to remove the entire tree. You're going to remove the tree, but you're also going to disturb the soil. You're going to disturb all of the microorganisms in the soil. You're going to destroy, depending on where you live and depending on the exact population that you're at, you're going to destroy, like, ant colonies in the soil. You might destroy, like, gophers and voles and shrews. Um, maybe other organisms that live in the soil, depending on where you are. There's tons, right? So you clear the, the trees. It's a long, arduous process, but it's a long, arduous process one time. And then after that, it's a lot less arduous. You have sunlight coming up. You have a uh, soil that is nice and even that you can easily move a machine on or you can, you know, take oxen and plow it, for example, if you wanted to, if you wanted to till it. Um, if you didn't want to till it, you can still have good soil and you can amend that soil much more easily. And perhaps more importantly for a lot of people, you don't have all this competition that you had before by the trees, for example. So you clear the forest, so you have the trees that are gone, and you have this plot of land. What's the next thing that you do? Well, you plant the seeds, right? You germinate the plants in the soil. You sow the seeds. And that's sort of, well, how do you do that? You're going to maybe do it in a row. And people do this, like, again, plants don't normally grow in perfect rows, but we do this for a reason. We do this because it's easy to assess the plants afterwards. We do it because it's easy to take a look at the plants and it's easy to harvest the plants or their fruit, their produce. So whether or not you're harvesting fruit or parts of the plant or the whole plant, you are going to you're going to germinate the seeds in a certain way, in a way that will maximize your ability to make minimal labor labor happen. I'm sure that makes sense. So if you don't do that, let's say, you're like, all right, well, I want to be, I don't know, I want to grow the plants like they might be arranged normally. Well, that's, you know, how do you, how do you know that? How do you know what that even is for your plant? And especially if we're dealing with plants that are elite cultivars or plants from, um, you know, that have been cultivated for millennia. Well, they're not really being developed in the same way that their wild ancestors are either. But if you were to, if you were to scatter the seeds and you were to put them in the soil that way, then you're going to have all these plants growing every which way. And, you know, again, like there's many, many different kinds of crop species out there. 
but vineyards, for example, are a good are well, they're a good example of how structure and um, forethought makes a really big difference. Obviously, obviously, we've been doing this for like thousands of years, right? Growing grapes, especially grapes to make wine with. I suppose especially grapes to make food with because you would think that food grapes came before wine grapes, but uh, I digress. Um, in a vineyard, if, you don't, if you're not aware, you know, you've got trellises and you can grow wine, you can grow uh, vineyards in a bunch of different ways, grape vines. But typically, people grow them on a trellis. You have them in a very orderly uh, row, and you um, you have them kind of grow along this this long wall, essentially that you've built up for them. If you didn't, they would just kind of grow on the ground, like a lot of plants do. They might not stand up straight up, depending on the cultivar and a bunch of other factors. So you have to consider that as well. What are you growing? How does it normally grow? How can you grow in the way that's going to maximize how you're, how you're going to get your output? At the end of the day, that's what most agriculturalists are dealing with. That's the thing that they're worried about the most. They're worried about how much food can I make and how can I make the most food? If you're doing it from a financial standpoint because you have to keep afloat as an, as an entity, as a business, for example, um, then you're worried about profit. To a degree. I'm not saying that just because profit's a thing that you think about that it's the only thing that you think about, but it's an important thing to think about because if you don't make enough profit to, like, continue on, uh, you're not going to exist as an entity anymore. It's like nutrition. It is nutrition for a business to have profit. But at the same time, if you're myopic about it and you only think about profit, uh, and you don't think about any other factors at all, then you run into a big problem of screwing yourself up, right? Because if you're somebody who grows, uh, let's say, watermelons, and you give a chem- you put a chemical into you, a chemical pesticide, rather, um, you apply it, and uh, all of those watermelons are now like toxic. But you're not worried about that. You're just worried about the fact that you have the best yield. Uh, out of everyone else around you, all the other watermelon growers have half the yield that you have. They had to deal with pests. They had to deal with disease. You did not, except for the fact that you have now poisoned the people that are eating your food. That's a big problem. And then people are going to come after you for that. Um, So, you know, you have to consider a lot of things. And some people are poisoning in a very small way, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but you've got this sort of issue you have to consider of, um, yes, you might want to grow as close to nature as possible, or you want to grow in a way that is maybe authentic, for lack of a better term. You want to grow in a way that is, um, like, not going to be unhelpful to the environment. But I feel like it's pretty obvious from an ecological standpoint, and this is where I bring it back to ecology, that... All agriculture kind of negatively impacts nature and the ecosystem around it. So it's always going to be about mitigation. Always. It doesn't matter. Even if you just do one thing, even if you do just one thing that's clearing out that forest, in my example, you're still destroying the trees and you're still destroying the organisms in the soil. I mean, I don't know any way that you can do that without doing that, right? You cut the trees down, you rip up the stumps, or you dissolve the stumps, or you do whatever you're going to do to the stumps. But um, ecosystem is more than just the trees, but even a tree can be an ecosystem. That's what I'm trying to get across here. There's this concept called the hollow biome. Um, And essentially, so, if you have... So you have your genome. I have my genome. It's the human genome, right? And you have your human genome. And plants have their genome. And so do insects. And everything has their own genome. But all of the gene... If you reduce it down, all of the genomes are just using physical bodies to 
affect each other, if that makes sense. So, like, if you, like, reduce it down to all of our barcodes, right, um, then we're just barcodes interacting with other barcodes chemically, physically, mechanically, um, sonically, all kinds of ways. And that's, uh, plants have their own barcode, right? Um, abiotic things are obviously not living, but you see where I'm going with this. And so, um, the easiest way to consider or to articulate how a tree can be its own ecosystem is the fact that you can be your own ecosystem, right? Because you have a microbiome. I mean, you have cells that make up your own self, right? You are essentially an ecosystem unto yourself. And it's not any different for trees, and it's not any different for any other mammal, or even insect or arthropod for that matter. You've got viruses, you've got genes that are exogenous, you've got genes that come from other organisms that have been horizontally transferred to your ancestors, and then vertically transmitted to you through an ancestral line. Um, sometimes you have organisms that uh, transmit genes from one kingdom of taxa to a totally different kingdom of taxa. And if you're not aware, for example, you've got aphids, right? So if you don't know this, aphids actually have genes from a very, very, very old fungal group. And those genes were uh, horizontally transferred to an aphid ancestor millions of years ago. But what it does is it allows the aphid to biosynthesize carotenoids, which is not something that a lot of organisms can do. They have to eat other organisms that produce these carotenoids, and they can't synthesize them themselves. But they can, and that's all because of this, like, wacky hijinks that happened millions of years ago. And that's had an extreme founder effect where all the descendants from that point have this special adaptation, and that's allowed it to be better at what it does. And this is true for most, well, I mean, not that the genes come into the equation, but this is true for a lot of traits, actually. And if you have a tree, that tree might have what are called endophytes. An endophyte is an organism that lives inside, or endo, to the tree. And the tree is the phyte, right? Phyto, phyte, plant. So the tree is um, full of microorganisms just like you are. Instead of being in their intestinal tract and in their respiratory system, instead of being in their circulatory system, as pa so technically endophytes can be positive or negative, but they are inside the tree. And an endophyte can sometimes be beneficial if it's like a, for example, a fungus that kills insects. So that fungus might radiate out into the tree, into the leaves, or maybe it came in through the leaves. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the plant pest that comes in might feed on the, on the leaf, get a little bit of fungal tissue in there, and oh, all of a sudden that fungal tissue is actually entomopathogenic and it kills insects. So that organism comes in, and unbeknownst to itself, it's eating this fungus that's going to kill it. And so that sort of relationship ends up being conserved, because as long as that fungus can enter into the plant... Now, the plant, you know, is just sort of a, a, a by... you know, sort of a bystander here, possibly. It depends on how um, structured the relationship develops over time. But that endophyte, that fungal endophyte in this example, gets into the plant, radiates into the leaves or wherever, a pest comes in, eats it, and dies. That's going to increase the survival of the plant, and that's going to increase the survival and the symbiosis between the fungus and the tree. So there are endophytes like that. There are pathogenic endophytes, which we just call pathogens, that are going to do physiological harm to the plant right? Uh, viruses are an example, bacteria, right? Um, so when you clear even a single tree, you're getting rid of an entire ecosystem unto itself. And then if you clear multiple trees, you're getting rid of a population, a larger ecosystem. Inherently, all of this is destructive. But really, what's the difference between an elephant destroying a tree 
and a person destroying a tree? Not much. I mean, not from a fundamental standpoint anyways. But obviously the human might be destroying a tree for a particular reason. It might want to make a clearing, like I just articulated before. Uh, an elephant might be doing it out of panic, it might be trying to get out, get away from something, it might be just scratching its back and the roots might be loose and it just toppled over. There's a, there's a, chi not to do like the whole, oh, there's a Chinese saying kind of a thing, but there is a, is a Chinese parable, and some of you might be aware of it, but I'm going to articulate it here because it's, I think, really helpful to understanding, uh agriculture and where it fits into ecosystems and how all all agriculture is ecosystem or environmental management essentially because there's a story where um, there's an old farmer and I'll be quick about this there's an old farmer he has a son and he has some horses and one day his horse runs away from the farm and the you know his friends come in and they say oh geez man that, that sort of sucks and the farmer goes, maybe. A few weeks later, horse comes back with a whole bunch of other horses. The farmer's friends go, wow, that's amazing. And the farmer goes, maybe. And you can see where this is going, right? So his son gets on one of these horses, and he breaks his arm, or leg, or whatever. And that, uh, that farmer says, or you know, the farmer's friends say, oh, uh, that sucks. And he says, maybe. And then a, uh, a conscription officer comes in looking for soldiers, uh, to conscript for the Chinese military. And they find that the son is unfit to be in the military because his arm is broken. And then his friends come over, you know, again, the farmer's friends come over and go, gee, what a stroke of luck. Maybe. So you never know what the consequences are to an action like that. You just don't know. And sometimes they can be positive and negative, depending on what your perspective is, right? So if you hold no perspective, or you try to kind of eradicate as much bias as you can, you come to a certain conclusion. And that conclusion, if it's really neutral, in, in my opinion, I think that it's really important to consider neutrality and trying to get rid of as much bias as possible when you're considering these options. But you're always going to have, as an agriculturalist, the bias of having to make some profit, feeding people, so you're going to have a human-centric bias, which is okay. That's not a bad thing. Animals have an animal-centric bias. I mean, they're not thinking organisms necessarily always, but they're going to worry about their own survival. They don't want to be hurt. They're going to try to eat food when they can that sort of a thing. So, I mean, I'm not trying to moralize any of this. You can disagree or agree. Um, philosophically, fundamentally, it doesn't really matter here, because what I'm trying to say is that whether you agree or disagree with having a human-centric bias, agriculturalists generally do, and agriculturalists are worried about what they're making and how much food they're going to feed, or how much, how many people they're going to feed, and they're going to worry about things like, um, hopefully, what their environmental impact is going to be. And a lot of them do. Sorry, I guess I, I lost my connection. Hopefully you guys saw all that. Um, I'm going to recap here because I'm, I'm losing a connection, I guess. So, essentially, agriculturalists have a certain bias, a human bias, that we all kind of share, most of us anyways. But whether, even if you clear a small plot of land of plants, trees, small plants, shrubs, whatever, you are destroying not only the ecosystem of the individual plant, but you're also destroying the ecosystem of the population, the community, multiple populations of different species. And that can have an effect, sort of a butterfly effect, on many different places. Um, depending on how big the swaths are, depending on other factors like are you using pesticides? And I don't just mean chemical, systemic, manufactured pesticides. Even if you don't use any of those, 
you're still affecting the environment. You're affecting the, you're affecting the environment in multiple different ways. You grow a plant that's not from its native land. A lot of plants we grow for food are not native to where they're grown. But the pests follow them, and then they interact with this new native environment. For example, the fig eater beetle. I'm sure a lot of people, if they're from California like me, they know that around this time, or maybe it just passed, probably it just passed, it's October, there are fig eater beetles, these giant green beetles. They're not Japanese beetles, those are a different species, but uh, they're called fig eater beetles because they eat people's figs and other fruit. But um, it's sort of a misnomer because they're native to here, and there weren't any figs before humans came and planted them here. They're actually cactus fruit beetles. That's what they normally eat. But the fruit that we brought is way more appetizing, or maybe just as appetizing. But they grow here, and they live here, and now those new plants are here, and they eat those plants too. So now they're a new pest, but they're native. So even if you have a pest that comes from the native territory that eats the new plant, or the reverse, where you have a pest that comes from somewhere else and comes here and eats both the exotic crop plants as well as the native plants and foliage here, you know, you're still interacting with the environment. You're still facilitating this interaction between the environment and you and your plants, which are now part of the environment if you want to be um, cogent about it, if you want to be exact about it. They are all part of the environment. It's just that we as humans sort of compartmentalize it and articulate it in a special way that allows us to kind of perceive in a specific fashion that makes it easier for us. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm definitely not advocating for people to not do that. It's just that it can make it a little bit harder to see the wider context in environmentalism and ecology. And in some cases, it's a question of whether or not, and I know this is an uncomfortable statement, but even if you do use pesticides, any kind of pesticide, even if they're like natural or organic or they're um, less toxic or they're more specialized, they still affect the environment. You're never going to not do that. Never. I mean, maybe. Never say never. But you're always going to have an impact. Positive impact, negative impact, net neutral impact. But from what perspective? Again, this is also a human perspective. Ecology and environmentalism is also a human perspective. It's not an animal perspective. Plants aren't going around teaching at Harvard about environmentalism. People are doing that. So, like somebody in the comments mentioned just now, it's uh, about being a good steward. And you have to understand that... Um, you're the you're the thinking host here. You're the one who's um, part of the system. I mean, obviously, you can't help being part of the system, really. So you just should be aware of what's going on. And if you are directly aware of what's going on, or you're directly acting in that way, as like an agriculturalist might, then you have to consider those options and those facts. Because if you're myopic... If you're close-minded and you're short-sighted, then you might screw up the environment for your own detriment as well as other people's detriment. But if you don't, you might be able to mitigate that quite a bit. And we'll still always have these impacts. You know, we're never not going to have them. That's sort of the truth of the matter. And I keep saying that. I hope I'm not a broken record at this point. But it's, it's a true, real, and important statement is that, like, for example, with honeybees, and I really don't know how much time I have left on this live feed, um, but with honeybees, I'll go into another example. A lot of people uh, think that honeybees are um, dying off. They're not. Uh, honeybees, for example, are not even from North America. They're from, like, Southeast Asia, thereabouts. And... Um, Although their applicability to agriculture is high, um, most bees don't even, you know, form colonies. Most bees don't make honey. Honeybees do. That's why they're called honeybees. Um, they're also super generalist pollinators. 
What does that mean? That means that compared to other pollinators, other generalists, they they don't feed us on on as many flowers. They don't um, go oh, as far okay. as honeybees do. They don't have the same aspects. Yeah, they're not even from Europe. Um, I mean, it depends on how. So somebody's asking me this question. Wait, they're not even from Europe? No, not if you. I mean, if you go back far enough, right? They're not even from Europe. They've been in Europe for a long time, though, and you can make it an argument about naturalization. But um, that's not... I mean, there are wasps that make honey, too, down in, like, Mexico area, I believe. I'm saying that right. Um, so there are honey-making organisms. There's also some in Australia, too, um, some smaller bee colonies that make honey in Australia. Those exist as well. But the vast majority of pollinators and nectar feeders and pollen eaters don't... They don't, uh, they don't reach as many plants as honeybees do. Why is that a bad thing? Well, it depends on your perspective, right? But it can be detrimental to the local ecosystem because nectar is a finite and highly variable resource. So if you have a honeybee, for example, or a colony that goes to all of the flowers in a certain diameter... They're going to be robbing nectar, robbing. You can see I'm putting my own bias into the statement right now. But if you are with me for a moment, take a look at this. So you have nectar. It gets fed on. The nectary depletes, and then it takes some time for it to replete with nectar. Same with pollen. So the other organisms that are native to the area will depend on that pollen if they feed on nectar, if they feed on pollen right? And so if they are devo if they don't get as much pollen or as much nectar, they might not starve, but that will have an effect, a subtle effect on how they develop. And there's competition. There's always that competition. Even between organisms of the same species, of different species, um, that makes sense, I'm sure. So if you have a super generalist honeybee that goes around and depletes all the nectaries and just continuously does that to make honey, you are, you are um, depleting that food source for other organisms. And you might not outright kill anything. Not at first. But as time goes, and maybe a little bit less of those native populations that eat nectar... They're just a little bit less nourished, and maybe they, maybe they don't run away from their predators as efficiently, or maybe the few that are on the cusp of like starving, maybe a few more of those die, and a few more of those die every year, and you can see where I'm going with this, right? That eventually the problem that you run into is that all actions are going to have consequences that are probably going to be both positive and negative depending on your perspective and they might be happening not at the same time not at concurrent times and maybe not even subsequently but they might be happening um 5 10 150 2000 years in the future you don't know and combined with all the other complex interactions that are happening it's really difficult to get a spin on everything it's really hard to perceive all of the different complex situations that are happening at once and what those are going to become. You don't know what all the atoms are doing at once. You can't, you know, predict the future in that way, at least not yet. But that does make sense, I think, is that uh, even if you bring organisms, even if you, like, have livestock that are native or not native, but they're, like, even if you use livestock even, instead of, like, machines, for example... Even if you have a low footprint, you still have a footprint, and you still have an impact, and you still have a direct impact on the environment in which you're living, and in which you're raising plants, and in which you're raising livestock. So even, even the best intentions are going to have an effect and a consequence. And it might be helpful to not consider it uh, to be necessarily always so negative or always so positive, depending on your perspective, of course, but there's always going to be a human impact as long as we're growing plants and food for ourselves in that way. Whether it's meat or vegetation, it doesn't really matter. Um, you're still going to be having that impact. 
Growing fungi is the same way. Growing insects for foods is the same way. It's still going to have an impact. Whether, I mean, and that's like, there's agricultural impacts, but there are also things like, um, you know, uh, I mean, there's so many. There's taking mealy, uh, mealy bugs, mealworms from one location to another, making, maybe making a big, like, like farming them, like making a big insectary. You know, so there might be now more people going out to find new genetics for that. Um, you know, uh, that's probably a bad example, but a lot of people aren't aware of it. But you've got, you know, like when people go out to find um, uh, new genetics for plants, well, then you've got more of that human impact coming in. I've got a question here, and I don't know how much time I have, so hopefully that works out. But I'm getting asked by Andrew Giebelhaus. I hope that I've said that right. How would you recommend mitigating an outdoor pest problem, specifically through symbiosis? Would you recommend IPM, or could you elaborate on this subject? And then I'm getting from Snowtill89, have to go, but this was great, thank you. I appreciate that. I felt very inspired to talk about it today. Um, so, good question, Andrew. Uh, well, I would always recommend IPM because IPM is more like a, it's like a philosophy of how you do things. And I know a lot of people use it as like a buzzword or like a cudgel, like I'm just going to IPM this, but that doesn't make any sense really. Um, and that's not a dig at you at all. Uh, so integrated pest management is IPM. And I would definitely say that that's the only way to be uh, symbiotic in your relationship with your crop, for example. But what it means to be integrated and what pests you are managing depends on what you're doing. Um, so, like, I really can't give any general examples. But, yes, integrated pest management is the way to go. And even that system, compared to, like, in the 70s, has changed dramatically into the, you know, into the second millennium, second millennium, right? Um, and so it's going to, it's going to change further and further as our technology increases, as our understanding of plants increases, right? So, um, if you want, send me a message and we can talk about that because I'd love to help you out with that. I think that's a really important way to look at things. And I think that, uh, that's definitely talking to the theme of this story, which is that you want to interact with as maybe as little impact as you can and maybe like help the environment as much as you can. But despite all of that, you're still going to have your human impact and you're still going to have the efforts of like mechanization for the foreseeable future. You're still going to be using uh, non-native plants to feed you. You're still going to have uh, non-native pests that come in on those non-native plants uh, and then they go on to native plants maybe, or you have uh, an interaction between an ancestor from one place and another ancestor and they hybridize. Like, is that bad? Is that good? I don't know. You don't know either. Nobody does. Anyways, hopefully that wasn't too, like, hopefully that was helpful. Um, I, sp I appreciate it. Zerf, always a great show. Sink Angel, full of knowledge. It's much appreciated viewing. I'm happy you felt so. And Andrew says, I understand completely IPM is vague. IPM is complex, definitely. And so, but I knew exactly what you meant. I knew that you meant that, um, is it best to use integrated pest management? And the answer is yes. It is always yes, as far as I'm concerned. It's just that how that looks for everyone is going to be a little bit different. But please, send me a message and I'd be happy to help you. I think that's a good place to wrap. Um, this video is going to be on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, Z-E-N-T-H-A-N-O-L. Um, the fact that I have to spell it out probably means it's a bad name. Maybe I'll change it. Maybe I won't, but, um, I'm probably not going to at this point. So Zenthanol, YouTube, please subscribe if you're interested in these sorts of videos and this sort of content. I will be making more and more of it in the weeks to follow. I have pest or inf information. I have sort of this ecological, environmental information on my YouTube channel, and I'll be making more videos on it um, in the near future. And if you have some ideas for what you want to see, please let me know, because I'm always interested in coming across and discovering new information, and also disseminating that information for people who are interested. 
So my last video had to do with ecology and environmentalism and agriculture and how they all kind of coalesce. Um, but I got a lot of questions from people who wanted to ask about that. So I want to put up this video for people who want to ask that question. All, any of those questions, really. I thought, you know, I'm going to be here for a little bit longer. So I thought I would throw this up, take some hot takes, questions, commentary, people who want to ask those sorts of questions. I'm here for that. Hopefully you are still around and are interested in such things. But to fill up the empty space, I'm going to sort of continue to talk about this. This will also be on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, as well. So if your question got answered and you want to come back, you want me to come back to it, or you want to come back to it, um, it will be up there on my YouTube channel for that. Um, so let me kind of bring it back and mention what I was talking about before since I referenced it. Essentially, in agriculture, you will always have an impact. And saying that you have an impact doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be positive or negative. In fact, what it means to be positive or negative is sort of unclear. And it's really hard to say whether something is going to be uh, good or bad, positive or negative, in the moment. And even many years from the moment. Because at the end of the day, it's sort of morally relativistic about whether or not human intervention is a good or a bad thing. To humans, it's going to be usually a good thing, especially if it benefits humans. But, um, you know, just like a parasitic or symbiotic or commensalic or mutualistic relationship, there are many shades to this sort of symbiosis. And um, one might make the point that a lot of uh, human interactions with the local ecosystem and the global ecosystem has been parasitic to a degree, you know? So that is sort of, I would say, that is sort of where I come from. But I do think that it's also important to know that, um, realistically speaking, uh, even like the most mutualistic, symbiotic relationship that an agriculturalist or any sort of cultivator, be they a lowly or humble gardener, salt of the earth, or it is a huge, you know, cosmopolitan, uh, you know, uh, well, not cosmopolitan, but a huge agricultural industrial monolith, you know, um, you're still going to have an impact. You're still going to have an impact. Even if the only thing that you do is clear a plot of trees, you're still going to have an impact. That impact right there, sort of small in comparison to other things, but not small to the tree, not small to the microbes, right, that are in that local area. And, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to say that humans should return to the, like, impoverished, you know, poverty of, like, you know, uh, hunting and finding game and, and foraging for food. I think we're kind of past that. Um, but as the population increases, as we kind of... As we even hurt our own selves, not to get super preachy, but even as we hurt our own selves with industrialization in some regards, um, I think that it sparked a lot of good, um, I guess you could say it sparked uh, a reawakening and, and, and appreciation for the environment. However, you're still going to, um, again, have an impact. And... A lot of people, I think, feel like they can sort of erase their impact a little bit by adopting certain practices that kind of, like, excuse the other practices. But from a systemic standpoint, it's really hard to do it all the way 100%. Unless you're, like, totally isolated, totally independent, which pretty much nobody is. Everyone's on, for the most part... The people who are important in this conversation are on the grid, the ones who can make the most change, the ones that benefit from the system the most, the ones who also don't benefit from the system the most through that grid, through that system and hierarchy. Um, God, I, I don't really, I really don't want to sound moral, like I'm moralizing or demoralizing anyone, but I think you see where I'm going. Everything's kind of connected. Um, 
that is no longer like hippie speech. That's a true statement. You you live in the environment. The environment lives in you. Um, you know, Matthew Gates, 2018, quote me. Like, <laughs> um, But the best thing that you can do, as this person here is saying, uh, natural alternatives 420, uh, least we can do is try to rejuvenate as we go. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, you're always going to have an impact, but if you can kind of mitigate that as much, as much as possible, we'd be doing very, very good for ourselves. We just don't always do it. That's sort of the problem. And we haven't been doing it for a long time, partly because of ignorance, partly because of, um, not caring. So, anyways, um... But this stream is for questions. This stream is not for me uh, talking on and on about what I already made a point about. But that's kind of that's kind of what my point is, that in an agricultural system, you're always going to have impact. The ecology is always going to be affected, but you might be able to mitigate that somewhat. Um, so please ask some questions, because that's the point of this live stream. Um... Yeah, garden tech, lack of education. Yeah, absolutely. But also, like, I'm talking from, like, a, a... Like, from a human population standpoint, you know, people didn't know what genes were up until very recently in human history. Um, and now we kind of understand that. I mean, we had understandings of, like, if you breed two really good cows together... Or, or if you breed plants together, you know, Mendelian genetics is rather new in human history. Um, but Lamarack, if you don't know who that is, hopefully I'm saying uh, his name right. Um, but, you know, the idea of, like, epigenetics, uh, or, well, well, Lamarack didn't really talk about epigenetics. Lamarack talked about, like, if you had a, basically what you did in your own life or what your animal or plants do in their own life will affect their progeny. And that's true, that's where epigenetics comes from, but it's way more complex than that, as we're, as we're finding out. And uh, for a long time we said, no, that's not true, that's not true at all. Um, and that was around the time we had the theory of evolution and that sort of like genetic scientific revolution that came about. But now we're saying, wait, 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 Lamarack was kind of right about epigenetics, but, you know, it's it's not like that, it's more like this. Um, but then, past that, you know, humans were just trying to survive, and they took food that worked, and they maybe ripped them out. I use that term very, very roughly, but, you know, they took their plants from their native area, let's say potatoes in South America, for example, um, and then, you know, maybe there are endophytes, like I talked about before, that will be in that plant, that will kind of act as like a secondary immune system, or as like a secondary root system if they're mycorrhizae. So you take those plants, maybe because you are going to be attacked by bandits, you know, I'm, I'm really increasing the narrative, like, struggle here, but it's, it's a true thing that happened in, in history. You know, your, your city is going to get sacked by an invading group of other people, other humans. So, you know, you got to, like, up and leave, maybe. Um, that's sort of a dramatic example. But, like, essentially, you know, whether you're a culture that was nomadic and didn't really have a set area and lived off the land and, uh, you know, hunted certain animals... Maybe you lived in a place that you couldn't cultivate plants very well and you ate food that way. You still have an impact, right? Um, as your population grows, you're, you know, sort of the idea of, like, carrying capacity in ecology. But, but humans didn't have any of that concept, or they had very little of it. Um, the fundaments, sort of, the basics. Now we understand it way better, and it's just a matter of disseminating that information. Um, Global Noise says, big up, Sync Angel, or Sync. I appreciate that, definitely. Any other questions? That's why I'm here. Um, let's see, can I talk about something else that's related to that? Well, like, carrying capacity, right? So, like, like the globe, the earth that we live on, um, 
has it is the uh, really the ultimate carrying capacity for all life on Earth, not just human life. So you again run into a problem where, when we talk about the human population growing, I mean like we are going to constantly displace other other organisms, millions of other organisms. If we don't find a more like resource or energy regenerative uh, manner of going about things. But, you know, even if we do, even if we do, even if we found something that's like almost 100% efficient, it's still not going to be perfect because humans are corporeal beings and as long as we still need food, we'll still have to mm-hmm. eat more food. We'll, ha- we'll still have to um, process more food. We may still have to even uh, work and travel and do all of those things. And we might not, like the technologies might not be at the same time. We might find something that's way better energy, like for batteries and things like that. But we're still driving cars. We're not driving flying cars. We're not teleporting. We're not doing any of those things that are like in high sci-fi, right? That might be able to mitigate some of that like pollution and that sort of a thing. Oh, but I have a question, so I'm going to stop talking about that and go on to here. Garden Tech asks, uh, local microbials versus outsourced microbials. I think that's a question. Um, yeah, I mean, in the span, like in the in the concept of ecology, that's a tough one because it depends on what your perspective is. Like I've been saying, <laughs> that's not a really good answer. That's an unsatisfying answer, but it's true. So, like, um, if we're talking about, like, microbes that are beneficial to the plants specifically, then we kind of narrow our viewpoint a little bit. Um, Colorado Natural Farming says, Wish I was getting credit for this. Learn more from you than my uh, Bachelor's of Science TA. Well, I appreciate that. (laughs) That's a really high compliment. I appreciate that. But to answer the question from before, essentially... Um, if you're just asking like microbes from one place or another place, future 4200 4, actually at this point, love your feed. Well, I love your feed. So I appreciate that. Um, so like if we narrow our viewpoint from all microbes to just microbes that are good for the plants, and then we narrow that to like what's going to benefit my plants in particular and what's not going to be detrimental to my plants in general, then we kind of get a little bit better perspective and I would say, and I assume that's what you meant. So, um, essentially, yes, I would say that local, yes, I would say that local plants or local microbes uh, might not be uh, the best way to go. It might be better to find microbes that are from where those plants are from, where from their wild ancestors are from. Like, for example, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to find, like, endophytes and mycorrhizae and, um, yeah, I guess we'll start with those. Endophytes and mycorrhizae who are trying to, that are trying to, um, or that would, like, ingress into the plant and bolster it in some way. Maybe as a secondary root system or as, like I said in my previous video, um, as like a anti-pest sort of symbiont, sort of a mutualistic relationship, you're probably going to have better luck finding those things in the natural, natural, in the original sort of area that the wild cultivars, or that the wild ancestors are from. But they might also just not exist. So you also run that problem. It's also possible that the original area where that plant developed is way different now, either from, hu- I mean, either because of human interaction or because um, it's just different, right? But I remember reading an interesting article about how people who were looking, and I want to say it was wheat, I really want to say it was like oats or wheat or something like that, they were trying to find uh, microbial endophytes that could um, help the um, grain, whatever grain it was, I want to say wheat, um, help it like stave off infection from pathogens, especially in the soil. And what they said was, if you're looking for that, what you should look for 
is um, you should find, I think they were in Ireland, actually. Oh, man, I really wish. I'll link it in the in this video. This video will go up to YouTube on my channel, Xenthanol. Subscribe if you're interested in this kind of content. And um, I will have a link to that article in the description of this video, Garden Tech. So if you're interested, please look at that. So I know that I have that article, and I hope I'm not misquoting it. But basically, they said they have a key. They had like a, a little like direction of like how to find the best plants that might be that might have those microbes. And they said look for plants that um, look like they're kind of staving off an infection that are stressed. Look for them. Look for plants that have the environment that are living in the environment that would be detrimental to your plants, essentially. And then you might be able to find microbes that are helping them live in that environment. That makes sense. Um, and they were able to like sequence the population of microbes. And so they're not local to the area that we're growing the wheat, but they are uh, in a different area. Maybe not the origin of wheat, but you can bring those back here and they can you can utilize them. So I guess the answer is like kind of both, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, uh, Doc CBD says, listening to you talk as I work on my plants is one of my fave things to do. Just saying, man, that really hits hard. <laughs> that really hits me in the heart. Um, I, I hope that like it comes off this way. I think it does. People have said that I seem to be very open and humble, and I really that's not like posturing. Um, I really appreciate that, man. It really means a lot to hear that, because that's why I make this content. I think a lot of people are just severely. Um, honestly underfunded. A lot of scientists, for example, and a lot of information is just behind a paywall. And I'm trying to like bridge that gap because we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do better as a, as a population if we don't share that information. And I really appreciate you saying that. Um, Grow Lifer says, got some explosive ember seeds popping up for Phalasis and Swarsky Eye. Yeah, so that's a reference to a video I made recently and a few posts about ornamental peppers like Exploding Ember and um, there were two other ones that had kind of nifty names, but essentially using ornamental peppers and their pollen in order to um, basically subsidize or uh, encourage the populations of predatory mites. Future4200 says, so in big wheat farms in eastern Washington, they get big patches of rust infections, but it's spotty. Think the stressed but surviving plants at the edge of the infected patches fit that theory? Yeah, I think so. It's very possible. Definitely. There's also like the subtle and, and sort of different phenotypic differences between all the populations, all the individuals. But yeah, essentially, that's what the people in the paper were saying, is that if you find a plant struggling but surviving naturally in the, in the, in the ecosystem um, that is in the environment that you're trying to combat, and maybe even the environment that you're trying to grow your plants in, try to find microbes from that area. That's basically what they said. Um, I never know how to say your name, but uh, ASP insects, I'm going to say. Exactly. We underestimate how detrimental paywalls are. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, like, yeah, I always cite all of my literature in my videos. Um, not these videos, because I'm just kind of talking off the cuff, but in my, like, pest primer videos where I go over pests, um, and even my, like, research report videos, which I haven't made in a long time, I always go over that, and um, I, I, I make that literature available for citation, and if you can't come across it, if there's a paywall, just let me know. Because I'm going to give it to you if you ask for it. So it's really that easy. Just ask me about it and I'll send it to you. Because I have access to it. Um, Grow Lifer says, put some bush beans and lavender plants for now until peppers get big. Very cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, future 4200. Fuck paywalls. Data dump. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, absolutely 100% against the idea of, I mean... You know, that information needs to be democratized, in my opinion. The Green Midas says, uh, what are some organic IPM habits you would advise against? Okay, so, good question. Um, every single answer to any sort of question is going to be like, it depends, because it depends on how you're growing. 
But, um, for example, I know that... And then we get into the definition of what's organic and what's not, because I might say something and they're like, well, that's not really organic anyway, so it doesn't matter. But it's like, all right, well, from a FD, FDA, no, <laughs> from, from like a, from a North American like standpoint, from a United States of America standpoint, where I live in California, in San Diego, um, I know that like copper sulfate, I want to say, I might get the name wrong on live. That's not good. But there's, like, copper products that are used a lot. And if you're not careful... So copper is really, really, really poisonous to a lot of aqu aquatic life. Mollusks are really um, gastropods. So, like, snails, slugs. That's a lot of time what they're used for. Um, but they're also really poisonous to, like, uh, organisms that live in the, um, in the water. So... I would advise against using, like, copper products if you can. I know that they're sometimes even certified organic, but, like, it's really quite noxious for your waterways. And so if you are going to use them, you should use them in a very specific manner. Um, and if you're not, um, you know, you might very much hurt the uh, surrounding wildlife uh, wherever you're growing. Um, that's one example. Um... I don't know how many people do this, but I think that's also, you have to, you have to be, you have to be careful. You have to be careful about, um, like where you get your microbes from. A lot of people have been talking about microbes in this feed. Um, I also mentioned them a lot in my last video, but it's important because, um, like for example, like it's obvious to me but maybe not to everyone that if you've got um if you've got my, like if you got a pathogen problem in your plants and then you're like I'll just mulch it that's not always going to be a good plan because sometimes you've got like powdery mildew or you've got botrytis that produce special spore sacs if they have you know if they're sexual which is not common but it's possible that you might introduce like um Clistothesia, which is an which is an old name for uh, chasmothesia. Now they're called, but essentially they're like overwintering spore sacs, is what you can think of them as, and um, they're meant to like take a little damage and keep on going. It's possible you might degrade them. It's also possible that they'll just show up in your mulch in the next season. So just be very cognizant about. If you have pathogens, if you mulch, if you compost, what exactly it is that you're putting into your system. Another problem that you run into is that even if it's not your own plants, a lot of pathogens are generalists. So you, you know, maybe that grass or those uh, trees that you're chopping down and mulching, they might be detrimental to your plants and they might introduce a pathogen that you didn't even know was going to be there. And that's, you know, another reason why it's really important to know the physiology of your pests and your pathogens. If you're growing one crop, it's easier. If you're growing a crop with companion plants, it's a little bit harder, you know. But just being aware and cognizant of, like, if I companion plant, for example, um, I need to treat the companion plants like my crop. I can't just, like, let them grow willy-nilly. Um, because again, that goes back to what I was saying about clearing a, 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 a tree in my last video, a tree plot. If you clear that plot of trees, then you're going to get rid of also pathogens and pests that might be residing in the, in the branches, uh, that might be attracted by the other small little plants that might live on there. You're going to get rid of all of that in the immediate area. Maybe not the really, you know, maybe not the immediate area like 10 meters away, but you're going to be getting rid of them like a foot away from your plants. You can tell them, you know, you can tell them scientifically minded because I just used metric and imperial at the same time. Um, but yeah, so like, again, um, if you take like cuttings and plant um, matter and things like that, and you're going to compost it, just kind of be aware of that. And if you're companion planting, just be aware of what pathogens can infect them and pests can uh, feed on them and then also possibly transfer to your crop. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea, it's just something you should be aware of. The Green Midas says, exactly why I was asking. What am I dumping when I dump my dirt? Exactly. It could be anything. 
and most people aren't going to go around and like sample a bunch of soil samples and be sure. And I'm not saying that you should, but that's sort of the problem. Certainly. Um, that's a good question about like IPM practices that like, or like organic practices that might not be the best, but like, you know, it, it definitely depends where you are and, and what you're doing. There's a, there's a really interesting sort of like, how do I put this? Well, like a lot of plants that we eat, we don't eat like scrub plants. We eat like plants that produce uh, fruit that are that are usually juicy, but not always. Nuts also are not like that at all. Um, lush, lush greens are very common, right? But we don't eat grass, right? Okay. But um, I bring it up because like some human cultures, when they developed, and as they're developing and are continuing to develop. Um, they don't necessarily have a big agriculture um, culture, right? Just like, so I, for people who don't know, um, I lived in China for a year, um, about six, six or seven years ago now, so it's, it's a little bit different, a little bit. Um, and when I lived there, like, I'm very aware of how ecologically things are not always so great, but there, it's a big agrarian... I bring it up because it's a big agrarian culture. But it's not a big cheese culture. Chinese people, not big fans of blue cheese. I am. But blue cheese is basically like controlled rot. I can see why somebody wouldn't be interested in it. It's very strong smelling if you weren't um, sort of like introduced to it at a young age. You still might not like it, but you might be more used to it. And I love it. I like a lot of cheeses. But other cultures just don't have the same, like, they just didn't do that, and so it just never became a thing. Now, it might be different now for people who are interested, but I bring it up because, like, you have cultures that didn't rely on a lot of agriculture, but they did rely on uh, ruminants and large animals that would eat the plants they could not eat. And then they would eat those organisms. So it's sort of like, not agriculture exactly, because you're not cultivating the plants, but it is like, um, you know, it, it, it is sort of like the harvesting of the plant matter through the meat of the organism that eats the plants. And I guess that's sort of true for all predators, right? But, um, you know, we don't, we eat like lush green plants for the most part. Uh, we don't eat like a lot of bark. We don't eat like really tough things that are full of like uh, cellulose that we can't digest necessarily. Um, I'm not a nutritionist, right? But like you can pass certain things, right? They're not necessarily going to be poisonous to you. But you do run into this sort of problem where like some cultures never did that, but what they did was something kind of like uh, like a step removed from agriculture through that. Um, like for an example. You've got, like, people who live up in the north where it's, um, you know, permafrost everywhere. The amounts of plant life you can eat is a lot less than perhaps closer to the equator where there's more biological diversity, more plant diversity, um, that sort of a thing. Yeah, so. Any other questions? You're welcome. You are very welcome. I'm happy to ask, or happy to answer. Happy for you to ask, honestly. Um, it's a it's a really cool it's a really important uh, question and it's a really important sort of topic and and my live feed just paused so that might be a sign there it goes again I guess I'm getting two pauses so um, again all of this will be on my YouTube channel um, in case you missed parts of it or segments of it or you want to see your name on it on the video when I mention you and in, in your question but um. If you have any other questions, please let me know. I'm going to wait a little bit longer, but um, I'm probably going to be wrapping up pretty soon at this point. You can see that I'm well-dressed because I was going, I was uh, filming something um, with a buddy of mine, so that will be coming out. You should look forward to that, too. But, uh, yeah, I guess I'll let people type if they're going to type. There's not a ton of people online right now I can tell right there but that's okay because for me quality is more important than quantity 
and the kinds of interactions that I get with people on my social media is uh, really enriching. People might think they're, they're being enriched from me answering their question, but I'm also being enriched by getting asked the question and, and, and sort of conceptualizing it and considering other people's questions and answers that might be different or similar or complementary to my own. And it's been a really great process, and I'm just... Just like uh, Future 4200 was saying, um, it's really important to me that people are a community and that we can all interact, even if we don't all do business the same way, even if we all don't sort of live in the same, like, ecosystem. And I don't just mean naturally, or I don't just mean with plants and animals and that sort of a thing, but we all come from different walks of life, we all have different sort of strengths and weaknesses, but together as a community, it's really important for me that we all kind of band together and we're able to, because, you know, we only have ourselves to rely on. And I'm not trying to, like, make it harder for us to do better, I'm trying to make it easier for us to do better. Um, here's a question from Natural Alternatives for 20 how does tissue culture get rid of pathogens compared to just cloning? Well, it doesn't always, but um, I, I should qualify that statement. Uh, essentially, depending on how you do the tissue culture, now I am not um, I am not a tissue culturist. I do not tissue culture, and um, I'm not qualified to do the process. So I might not even be qualified to uh, make this answer. But um, my understanding of tissue culture is that the reason why it works so well, depending on the pathogen that we're talking about, is that you're, deal you're, you're starting from such a small amount of plant tissue. You're st you're st you have such a small amount of um, material that it's way easier to get an uninfected amount of material than with a cutting, which is... Really, when you consider the proportions, it's astronomically larger. And so you have an astronomically larger chance of getting a pathogen. But if you have a systemic pathogen, right, so if you have like a virus, for example, that's systemic, um, not all viruses uh, are, I suppose, but most are in, in, as phytopathogens, which is what I'm referring to specifically, um, then you might have a problem there. If you have, like, um, an endophyte, you might also pick it up, I think. That's my understanding anyways. So, essentially, it, it works better because um, you're dealing with so much less tissue. And then you're growing from that. So you kind of have, like, um, you know, you just take a small little amount of skin and then just grow it out. As opposed to, like, taking an arm, which is going to be way more likely to have a whole bunch of things than the tissue culture. Hopefully, I am not giving an ignorant answer there. Yeah. Well, I think... Hmm. I'll give it a few more minutes. It's almost noon, and then I'll leave. Um... Oh, yeah, you're following me. Thanks, I, I appreciate it. Um, you're very welcome, and I'm happy for the opportunity and to ask the answer the question and uh yeah so um here's my chance to ask you all a question actually the people who are here um what are some video topics that you'd like to see and what are some like whether they're pests or pathogens or maybe just like i had somebody else in another in the other video talking about how um they wanted to see uh what was it i had just seen the comment um, but they wanted, they wanted, oh yeah, they wanted me to go over like, like how we're, how we poison the ecosystem essentially when I was talking about the ecosystem. And I think that's an important thing to, to go over. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways is really the answer. There's, a, there's many different, <laughs> many different ways. Um, but like even with like pesticides that are not systemic or, um, not, made in like a laboratory even if they're like from natural uh areas they're still toxins right like they're still meant to kill anything well or something very specific so 
even their usage can have a detrimental impact on the local environment, if by detrimental we mean killing non-target organisms. So, you know, it's really the state of mind and the, the intent rather than how you accomplish it, or how you accomplish it is what I'm trying to articulate. It's not, it's not that you're using a, a natural toxin as opposed to an unnatural toxin. You are using a poison at all. And it's a, if it's a chemical agent, then it's possible for it to be misapplied, applied too much, and affect other organisms if it's not super specific. And that's really how you can mitigate that. Uh, J. Paul, 1989, says, Talk about the bee species that are endangered and what threats it poses. I have time for that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of native bee species. Um, I mean, right? They're native to where they're from. But um, most bee species that are endangered are, they well, they're not gregarious. They're not eusocial. So they don't make nests necessarily. They don't make colonies. That's what I mean. They don't. Um, uh, they don't necessarily produce honey at all. Um, and they're usually much smaller. They're usually really small, and they might be parasites or they might be predators of different organisms in the ecosystem. Um, as opposed to like honeybees, for example, that drink nectar. Um, they, and then part of the question was, what are, what are threats of those organisms? Well, like habitat loss is a big problem. Um, that's probably the number one problem. That's what a lot of people say. And I think it's very true. It kind of comes back to what I was saying about agriculture. The more space we clear, the less space we have for everything else. It's, it's really simple and fundamental. It's, I mean, not hard to understand. So that's a big problem. The less and less habitat they have, the smaller the carrying capacity of the environment to sustain them. That plus all of the other different things that are trying to kill them and eat them and infect them. Uh, one thing about honeybees that people might not realize is that mm -hmm. they can also pass diseases off to native organisms, which is something I didn't touch on before, but that's very true. They can, t they can also, they can not only pass pathogens and parasites to native populations, the reverse can happen too, or the converse rather. Pathogens and pests can then infest and infect organisms like honeybees and then those can be spread to other places so that's a threat uh, food loss is a threat uh, space loss is a threat pests and pathogens that are exotic um, to the area is a threat uh, and then also just kind of like not necessarily passing those organisms if they're native also but or not necessarily like uh, taking them but like maybe making them more prolific because now maybe those pests and parasites have a much better vehicle in which to vector to many different other organisms. So that's a problem as well. I did it with a minute to go. So that's going to be it. This video is going to be online on my channel, Xenthanol. Z-E-N-T-H-A-N-O-L. Xenthanol. And please, if you're interested in this kind of information, please subscribe. I have a lot of content that I share on my Instagram, as most of you are aware. Um, but it also goes on to my YouTube channel, and things go into much greater detail a lot of the time on my YouTube channel, because you only have a minute in video, right? Um, yeah, Deal Grows, uh, please come across it uh, on my YouTube channel. I, you'll find this video and the video I just did before, or you can catch it here. And um, I'll take a, I'll take a break now. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Grow You, or Grow Roo, uh, and thanks, Natural mm -hmm. Alternatives. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it, and um, have a good one. And take this information and maybe like share it if you liked it, or um, try to do your own sort of make your own impact a little bit smaller for the environment if you can. I know we live 
live in a society, we live in a system, but you know, we do our best to try to mitigate those problems. Because if we don't, it's not going to look good.